processing in a certain sense. And in this 5,000 years, we had a computer for, well, let's say, what we, uh, what we think of uh, is a computer uh, for, well, let's say, 80 years or something like that. So the answer to this question is rather simple. The code was indeed first at least 5,000 years old, and I will cover this uh, topic later on. I will uh, start to briefly introduce myself. Uh, so, physical. <laughs> uh, my background is in theoretical physics. Uh, I did a lot of work in elementary particle physics. And I'm presenting these wonderful uh, formulas because I was dealing with this stuff for um, a couple of years. And on the left hand side, what do we see? Feynman diagrams. So, and I'm mentioning Feynman because he plays a very important role in the history of the computer. And I will uh, briefly sketch this role. And I'm personally a, a fan of, of Feynman because what he did when we went to the lectures, we had to calculate all these cross section from scattering processes and all this stuff. And so he brought us a very simple uh, technique to deal with very complicated processes. And this was the, uh, the way Feynman thought. And uh, a few years later, I realized that Apple um, produced a poster with uh, Feynman with the title Think Different. And this is what exactly characterizes Feynman. He was always a man thinking in a completely new, in a completely different way or manner. And uh, why I'm telling you all this stuff uh, because there's a very close uh, relation to the history of the computer. Because in, 90, in 1943, Feynman went to Los Alamos, as you might know, and he joined the computing or the computer uh, depart, uh, department um, in uh, Los Alamos. And you see him on the right hand side to Mr. Oppenheimer, and the Italian guy in front is Enrico Fermi. And uh, Feynman went to uh, Los Alamos as one of the youngest um, ingenious physicists in Bletchley and his well he worked on, on uh, theoretical physics but he uh, was responsible for the computer section as well and when we talk about the computer section in the Manhattan project we think of well it's not from Los Alamos but it's a very famous <laughs> uh, image um, so computers at that time were human and they were doing a lot of calculations. <coughs> and Feynman, uh, Feynman's work was to improve the process of doing these calculations. Very uh, sophisticated uh, calculations with only one number that came out. This was the energy release. So how good is the model for the bomb, to be more precise? And he invented the uh, parallel computing thing because he uh, divided the um, different calculation to different people and he improved the, the speed of doing these calculations. This was one task that he did, but then in 1943, one of the first punch card IBM machines came to Los Alamos to uh, supply the scientific work in Los Alamos. And uh, Richard Feynman was the guy responsible for the machine. The problem was, indeed, that the IBM experts had no clearance to enter the Los Alamos uh, place. <laughs> this was a big problem because there was no one in Los Alamos who was um, familiar with the machines. And so Feynman took over this job and he um, maintained the, the IBM punch card machine and he was doing a lot of repair work with the machine. And this leads me to my, my first statement. Indeed, Richard Feynman was the first computer creator in the world. Um, this was his job. He collected a lot of stuff. So uh, from the IBM machines, from other electromechanical calculators, and he tried to repair, to maintain the system, and he collected all pieces of calculators at that time in 1940. 1944. Um, uh, I would love to start a discussion after my talk which of my claims or statements are true or not true or joke or whatever. So what do you think about this? <coughs> yeah, and 
Well, here we see one of uh, the famous connection machine computers, and I did a lot of uh, research work on these parallel machines. And uh, whenever I see these photos, I realize that it's a long time uh, gone already, so I'm getting older, and <laughs> because these machines are now on display in the uh, computer museums worldwide. So, uh, <clears throat> does uh, anyone has a clue what the uh, computer performance was of such a machine? So, more or less 10 gigaflops. This was the main uh, peak performance of the, more or less, of this connection machine number two. Just you should compare it to the uh, current uh, GPU uh, unit that makes at least 1.4, 1.5 teraflops. You can buy these cards for 80 euros, uh, 800 euros or something like that. Uh, so this is a factor of 100 um, between the former supercomputer and the current uh, GPU <coughs> device. Well, <clears throat> this is a current supercomputer in in uh, the center of computer or supercomputing, and it's an IBM system, a Eugene system. And I show you the picture because we have to think about how to present such machines in a museum in 10 years. So this is uh, indeed a tricky issue. Um, whereas the connection machine, well, it's, you need some place, some space to, to present the machine. But, uh, well, this is much more complicated to, to bring it in, in the museum. But this is, a, uh, well, this is an exercise we have to cope with in, in the next 10 years, let's say, um, if we would like to continue uh, to tell the story of supercomputers. <coughs> so, we, have, uh, we, we are now on the way to Germany. Uh, to the middle of the world. Uh, this is <laughs> and you see London here. It's not too far away. So we have here, this is Germany. Uh, there's the road from Düsseldorf to Berlin. And somewhere here in the middle of nowhere, you will find the wonderful Paderborn place. Um, I will go a little bit closer. So you see, well, this is a rural, rural area, um, we had Hanover, and somewhere in the middle here, this is Paderborn. The, um, well, we call it, it's, it's the smallest big city. We call it big city in uh, Germany when uh, the city has more than 100,000 inhabitants. And we have 105,000, I suppose. <laughs> and we have the shortest river in Germany. So this is the Pader River. It's only four kilometers long. <laughs> But we have the largest computer museum, um, and so we're very proud of this, this fact. Um, and if you stand in front of the building, just um, go to the park side, the parking place. Uh, well, the building you see in, in the back is indeed the former headquarter of the Heinz Nixdorf Computer Company. So, as you might remember, Heinz Nixdorf founded the uh, Nixdorf Computer Company. Uh, in the beginning of the 1960s, and it was one of the largest computer producer in the 80s um, in, in Germany. So quite a huge company, and unfortunately the founder of this company, Heinz Nixdorf, he was born in Paderborn, and then he went to uh, Essen, another place, and he developed some ideas for well, electric, electronic circuits, and then he returned to Paderborn to set up the, the huge computer company. And uh, this brings me to my second statement. This is very interesting. I'm wondering what you will think about it. Um, Heinz Nistor started collecting computers. This is an interesting uh, issue because, uh, indeed, he, uh, well, he uh, had a huge collection for typewriters and accounting machines and uh, calculating machines, but that's the point. He collected all of his pieces that he sold to the companies, to banks. So he had the idea of, well, we have to, to, keep, to keep the history some, somehow. And uh, the, the main collection of our museum is based on the collection of Heinz Nixdorf. More than 2,000 different items from uh, different fields. Very uh, important collection, 
And so this is my second claim. Heinz Nixdorf starts collecting computers. You will see uh, we, we are very German oriented today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I told you that our history is rather long, so we step back at least 5,000 years in time. And um, we start our story with the invention of uh, script or of, of writing. And this was indeed the time when people start to do uh, co uh, economics or to do business. Um, in between the two rivers, the huge rivers in the Iran, Iraq um, area, and we see here a, a, a figure of the old Babylon uh, city with a tower. And this was exactly the time when people um, realized that they need media technology. So when I'm talking about media technology, so we are far away from any uh, electric uh, power supply, but they invented this, um, well, this, uh, this, this writing. And they used the clay tablets to engrave symbols and signals, uh, symbols and, and numbers to this small um, clay tablets. And this was, of course, a, a medium, so to say. So uh, for the first time, the people were able to store information, to put it on, on the clay tablet, just to pass it to someone else, to store it and to read, uh, re read it after a certain time. Of course, there was nothing uh, romantic about the invention of language. Uh, it's just, it was just to do bookkeeping. This was the aim of this, um, of this writings. Um, to talk about agricultural aspects, the brewery was a huge issue in Babylonia. Um, so this is another very German-oriented uh, <laughs> story. <laughs> well, this is... Uh, from my point of view, rather clear, uh, the way to, or the, the aim to, to handle with uh, information, to store them, to keep them, to path them, to uh, decipher, encipher information, is at least 5,000 years um, old. Oh, this is a wonderful story uh, about codes and coding without any machines. Uh, is anyone here familiar with this ancient temple um, writing language? So, because this is a wonderful story, in ancient Greece, uh, people tried to automize, um, for instance, the door opening of a temple. So this was a process. They wanted to demonstrate uh, power of the gods or whatever, and so there was a mechanism beyond this temple that controls the doors opening, then the fire starts burning, the fire stops burning, the door closes again. Uh, this was a very interesting uh, thing, and the Heron of Alexandria invented uh, a system to write codes for this uh, door control. And he used uh, such a, how would you call it, a wooden spool, some, uh, something like that. And depending on whether he winds the uh, rope clockwise or counterclockwise, counter he could control the door running to the right hand side or running to the left hand side. And if he uses this loops, well, this is the weight function. So in this particular case, nothing happened to the door. It was just standing still. And since we still lack of any electricity, this was a, well, this, this door, this is a cut through the door. You see here the wheels um, on which the door was moving, uh, or is moving forth and back. And where we have a sand depot upstairs and the sand falls down and it controls the, the, the rope. So this is just a very simple way to code arbitrarily um, the movement of, of these rolls, just moving front or back, or, well, here we can use the idle function. And uh, interestingly, we are the first museum worldwide that presents the history of software, not only the machines and the hardware. We set up uh, a couple of years ago our software 
Kubus, uh, an exhibition unit where you can discover the what is software all about, what is uh, what are al algorithms, and what is the history beyond this uh, computer science uh, problems. <clears throat> yeah, well, this is rather clear. My fourth um, statement: codes really don't need computers. So the media technology uh, technology changed dramatic, dramatically um, in the 15th century. So when Gutenberg invented printing with these uh, removable letters, and this was um, a breakthrough in well uh, providing people with books and printed stuff to um, to spread the knowledge of that time. And he did it, uh, you are quite familiar with this. I mentioned it because we have a lot of uh, exhibits on the show uh, in our museum where you can go into the details to find out what exactly happened at that time. Um, and you can have a look at these machines. They were assembled uh, or they were produced to do this uh, book printing and uh, wonderful machines, by the way. And we use one of the printing machines during our museum events that the visitors can uh, print themselves uh, certain uh, uh, documents. Well, the next uh, statement, indeed, uh, Gutenberg indeed solved the copy and paste problem, which opened the way of uh, handling with media things um, in dramatically. Then we go 100 years further, let's say. So the book, uh, books were available, and at that time, scientists uh, were pretty busy doing very stupid calculations. So, for instance, when they um, did a calculation in astronomy, let's say, just calculate when is the next moon eclipse or sun eclipse, they went through this. Well, this was a very effective way to, to um, uh, supply the, the uh, calculations with numbers, pre-calculated tables and numbers. Um, and at that time, well, let's talk about the 16th, 17th uh, century, people invented small calculation aids to um, make it more to make it more easy uh, to do all these uh, necessary calculations for astronomical purposes, for navigation purposes. Uh, but this is all, all hand-driven. Uh, it's, it's just a computational aid. I should uh, mention at that point that, uh, of course, all uh, photos you see here are taken from um, our exhibition. So this is another uh, ruler calculating aid um, to do some navigation calculation. And at that time, um, one very famous German uh, guy, um, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, invented the first mechanical calculation machine. And this calculation machine uh, was able to do for the four um, basic operations, multiplication, addition, subtraction, and division. This was the, one of the first, I should say, one of the first um, mechanical calculating devices. And you see here, this is our um, workable replique of the machine. And at certain uh, events, we are presenting this machine. And uh, fortunately, now the machine has the right precision to, uh, to work appropriately. Uh, but this was not the case in the 17th uh, century. And this was really a huge problem. I would claim at that point that the machine of Leibniz never worked appropriately. So <clears throat> this is, uh, well, I cannot prove this claim, but I I'm quite sure. And I've spoken to many of the people really familiar with all the uh, precision issues here. And so we came to the conclusion that the machine never worked exactly. <coughs> and this is my wonderful thesis, uh, well, claim that this is the reason why Leibniz invented the binary system. <laughs> so, because he was thinking about how, how can I make the machine 
um, or can I simplify the machine? What is the problem? The problem is, of course, that I have to deal with 10, uh, 10 numbers at least. And one way to improve the situation would be to switch to another operate, uh, not an operating system, but another number system. In this particular case, the binary system. We know, uh, well, the, uh, from, from a mathematical point of view, it was well known that there are other number systems available, uh, for instance, in the Indian uh, area. But um, I claim at that point that Leibniz published the binary system um, because he had in mind to improve his calculating machine. This is my next point. Leibniz invented the binary system because of precision problems with the uh, mechanical device. On the other hand, one should say from the museum point of view, this was a wonderful time. We have wonderful machines, uh, objects, uh, exhibits, which we can put in our museums. We can make them transparent to explain how the mechanic works in between uh, the machine. So we can um, teach our kids uh, what is the, what is the, the, the uh, mechanism beyond such a year machines. How does it work? This is, uh, from a museum point of view, really a good situation. We have this hands-on where you can test uh, how the machines worked. Um, we do have wonderful exhibits for the museum, accounting machines, let's say, um, which stand for themselves, or some other uh, original objects. Uh, where you can use, uh, where you can see that these machines were in use for um, dozens of, of years, and so well, this is a, um, a millionaire calculating machine, for instance. With, uh, I like this because you see how people uh, work with the machine. Or another option you have, you can do um, a copy of the original machine. So here we see one of this famous Müller calculating mill. Is this the correct expression for this calculating mill? Or? So you have a huge variety of options to present the, the, uh, well, the objects and to present the, uh, uh, well, the state of the art technology in this context. But then something uh, very important happened uh, around the uh, 1750s. Um, I suppose everyone knows what we, s we are seeing here. It comes from London. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a trial piece of the difference engine. And we got it from the Science Museum in London. And we are very proud of it. And this was a very sophisticated uh, machine to do certain kind of uh, calculation needed for uh, different purposes. I don't want to go into the details. But the interesting point is that Babbage and... Uh, uh, Excuse me, I thought you said 1750. This is, I think, why we didn't recognize it. What did they say? Sorry, 1850. <laughs> <laughs> No, and the next step was um, the invention of the analytical engine. And then for the first time, uh, Babbage developed the idea of a programmable machine that could do at least all possible tasks. And he was in close cooperation with Ada Lovelace. I would come um, to her, I, I will, uh, talk about her later, um, but this was for the first time that the idea of a universal computer arose in, in this context. Unfortunately, the technology was definitely not appropriate to, uh, well, to construct these, um, uh, these, huge, these huge programmable machines. On the other uh, uh, side, nearly at the same time, this is uh, one of our, uh, I really love this exhibit, this is the Chess Turk. We did a reconstruction of this automata, uh, well, which was released nearly at the same time as 
um, Babbage worked on the on the analytical engine, and Wolfgang von Kempelen presented it to a prominent uh, audience again and again. Well, this Turk was able to play chess, so he designed a machine to play chess. But we know, um, as I said, so. Uh, the intelligent systems were not available with gear machines. So he put a small man into the machine <laughs> and uh, responsible for the chess algorithms. So to do the calculations, um, Van Kempelen really needed a small guy sitting uh, in the dark uh, box. Yeah, it's, it's amazing because uh, we are presenting this, or demonstrating this chess Turk twice a year. And it's not necessary, well, you do not need necessarily a, a small man. So I can go in, in the box as well. So it's a little bit <laughs> uh, <uncooked> to be, <laughs> but uh, it, it works. And uh, so, what I would like to say at that time, with the te technology of that age, uh, you should uh, borrow the intelligence from, from the real people. This was the only chance to install some. Uh, intelligent, intelligent systems. Well, this is um, my next uh, statement. Well, steam engines and gear machines are definitely not the right stuff to uh, build up um, universal computing machines. On the other hand, and this is an uh, important issue, um, at the same time, more or less, another technology, uh, well, using more or less the same components, were extremely successful. We are talking about telegraphy uh, and telecommunication and the networks for, for telecommunication. Still using the same mechanical components and the electronic relays, but this was uh, very well suited for, uh, for this job, just to support information uh, as an electronic code from one station to the next station to the next station and uh, it was a perfect business model. You could earn a lot of money with just uh, providing the infrastructure for telecommunication. And so, but it's, it's interesting to see the both sides. So computing at that time failed completely. So, but telecommunication was really successful. And uh, at that point, I should mention, of course, the telephone was not invented by Alexander Graham Bell. Um, it was for sure invented in Germany when, <laughs> when Philip Rice did uh, demonstrated a first, um, well, a first experimental setting uh, to transport the, uh, the the human voice in a, as a, a analog current signal to the receiver. Unfortunately, he uh, forgot one very important point. So the way back was not uh, available at that time. It was a one-way telephone. Uh, and so it was just a, uh, another story here to say, um, does anyone know what the first sentence was um, uh, supported by telephone? First, sir? What's the weather like? <laughs> no. Das Pferd frisst keinen Gurkensalat. Well, this is a completely nonsense statement, but um, Rice used this nonsense sentences to uh, make clear that the receiver really got the message and not just interpolates the result. So, das Pferd frisst keinen Gurkensalat. Uh, it's a very strange um, uh, sentence. <coughs> Yeah, well, as I said, this, um, well, this was a perfect business model. You provide telecommunication networks and you earn a lot of money by just, um, well, uh, bringing information from one point to another one. Here we see our um, telephone exchange uh, and all this technology, this is very important. Um, was using a very simple but sophisticated uh, um, technology. And this was in 96, um, around 96, the invention that changed the world of the telecommunication dramatically. When the um, electronic tube or valve 
was invented by um, William uh, D. Forrest in the United States. Because for the first time we had uh, here, at that point, we had a device that could um, amplify electric current. So at a certain point, when you uh, look at the United States, let's say, well, you have a 8,000 kilometer long a cable uh, from the west coast to the east coast, and the problem is that there's a damping in the signal and you get nothing in the end. So this was a big problem for telecommunication and the uh, valve was the breakthrough to um, amplify the signal so that it was possible to go over thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers. And I'm mentioning this because um, we know that the valve um, uh, what breakthrough for the uh, electronic computers as well. But we should keep in mind, none of these technologies were invented to build computers. All the technologies I'm talking about here, uh, electronic relays, um, the valves, and uh, later on the transistor was not invented to uh, build computers, but to do telecommunication. So this is the uh, statement just to write, write it down, relays, valves, transistors were invented to earn money with telecommunication. And I'll come back to this point later on. So this is uh, the head of a very famous computer pioneer. Who do we see here? It's not so good, to be honest. Come on, I'm, I'm from Germany. <laughs> No, it's Konrad uh, Zuse. Uh, 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 yeah, well, it's not that good, the um, sculpture, but... Well, Konrad Zuse is uh, our German computer pioneer, but I don't want to start uh, the <laughs> tricky question, who invented the computer. Uh, I just want to mention some other points. So, because it's very interesting that well, he had all the ideas, the right ideas available around 1936, 1937. But he, uh, well, he's still lacking the right technology. So he started to build a universal computing machine with metal plates. This is really a, a strange idea. Just plates moving in the upwards, downwards direction and uh, to the left, right direction. And if you, well, this is the, uh, um, the copy of the machine done by Zuse himself in the 80s. So this is a later um, exhibit which is on display in the uh, Deutsches Technikmuseum in Berlin. Unfortunately not in, in Paderborn. But there are some video clips uh, available on the net where you can see how uh, the machine was operated. So there is this, what do you call it here in front? Of Right. Right. Uh, so this was this machine was operated manually, and you can hear the mechanics work, and uh, so you have the feeling to put some oil in the machine because it's so uh, noisy. Um, it was not a good idea to do a universal uh, computer with metal plates in any case. Uh, although he was using, uh, as you see, the 35 millimeter film rolls as punch card uh, control for, for the machine. So all ideas were around at that time. And uh, in the next step, in 1941, uh, Zuse designed a new machine, this time using the uh, electro, uh, yeah, the relay uh, technology available at that time. And we see here this wonderful a copy of the set three done by his son, Horst Zuse. And you remember, uh, some of you um, might remember the talk of Horst Zuse during the conference in June, uh, where he uh, presented the, the details on this uh, reconstruction project. And this was on display for six <coughs> months in Paderborn. And it was so strange. Every morning when I entered the building, uh, Horst Zuse was already in and doing some hardware debugging because the machine failed in some certain operations. Uh, and so it was always, uh, well, uh, rearranging the wires. And well, I was not sure if he really always exactly knows what he's doing with the cables. 
Uh, but in the end, it worked. So uh, now this um, machine, this uh, reconstruction project is on display in Berlin as well. But it will return to the Paderborn in one or two years, hopefully. <coughs> what, you, what you can see uh, in, in our museum, of course, are all the commercial pro products which were sold in the 60s and 70s. Um, wonderful, huge machines. Here, yeah, this was one of the uh, most successful machines, the Z11. And this is a, the statement I'm really looking forward to hearing your uh, <laughs> uh, 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 response to this <coughs> statement. Well, uh, but it's, from my point of view, um, so we were very lucky that the Nazis completely failed uh, in understanding what it meant to have a computer. And this was completely different uh, if you look at the UK or at the United States, for instance. They realized immediately that this is a perfect, te a perfect technology to do either nuclear uh, bomb calculations, to do, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, civilians, so here, uh, interception of the uh, German uh, deco uh, encoded, uh, decoded uh, radio messages, and they realized this is the right technology to tackle these problems. And this has not happened in Germany at all. I, I have no clue why this is the case, but we can uh, discuss this later on. Uh, well, I would say the Nazi ignored completely the invention of the computer that took place somewhere in between 1936 and 1941 in, uh, in Germany, at least. So, well, this is a famous uh, object here in this, uh, this uh, environment. Uh, we had this huge uh, exhibition on Alan Turing in 2012 in, in Paderborn. And uh, it was a wonderful cooperation with the with the team from Bletchley. When <laughs> so it's a very short story. I went several times to, to Bletchley, and we went through the um, decipher process with the bomb um, again and again and again till we really till I really understood what what was going on there. And then poor fella who took a lot of time to explain me all the details. Then he finished our session, okay, now you know everywhere, everything, we have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great pleasure for me to go through the, um, well, the different steps. Um, it's a fascinating topic, um, but as I said, the, um, the UK people realized immediately that uh, the invention of automated uh, information processing machines on a very fast level was, uh, was the clue to cope with the problem of the uh, encoded Enigma messages. <clears throat> In the United States, so we are very proud that um, we have some original objects on display from the ENIAC, from the American electronic computer, um, which was a huge uh, space to do uh, calculations um, partial differential equations, for instance, um, to do both the uh, calculation of uh, ballistic trajectories and, as I said, the, the first, in 1946, the first longer program that run was the calculation of the age bomb uh, in, in, in America. Um, it's strange when you look at this machine, who has a clue what the um, what the memory space was of the ENIAC. How many words could the ENIAC store? Uh, the room, uh, well, let's say, like, like this part of this uh, audience, uh, of this lecture room here, 22. <laughs> 22, 10 digits worth of the capacity of this huge, of this giant uh, electronic computer. And this was, by the, by the way, I would say this was the um, really clever invention of the UK computer pioneers to think about uh, a large electronic uh, storage capacities. Um, this was a very clever approach to, to cope with the problem of using two valves to store one bit. This is a very ineffective way to, to store information. 
And in 1942, uh, 1946, 1947, this was the breakthrough for uh, all kinds of electronic devices, the invention of the computer. Um, and the three guys were William Shockley, Walter Breton, and John Bardeen. I don't want to start a, a discussion about the European transistor project at that time, this is a completely other issue. But they um, demonstrated that they can use semiconducting uh, crystal uh, materials to control the, or to amplify and to control the electric uh, um, current. And this, is, uh, this was the setting um, in a very art-like uh, photography, I would say. <laughs> but uh, what was the other? At that time, so we have reached the 1950s, uh, 1970s, there was another huge challenge uh, that popped up in a certain sense. So we are talking about the Cold War. And when the people tried to fly to the moon and to, to uh, produce intercontinental missiles with nuclear uh, bombs on, on, on board. And here we see uh, the guidance computer, uh, uh, a detail of the guidance computer of the Gemini 1, uh, Gemini 2 mission, which was um, a test mission uh, before Apollo started in 1960. Okay. But this was this was a very um, this was a big challenge because when you fly to the moon, let's say, it's nearly impossible to use vacuum tubes somewhere uh, in your space shuttle. Huh? So it was extremely important to have a very reliable, light, and and uh, smart technology, electronic technology to uh, realize these um, space missions. And <coughs> this was the invention of the first integrated circuit. This was the idea. So we had the transistor, and the next step was to put one then more component um, onto a piece of, of uh, semiconducting material. And here we see, well, this is the, the copy of the first experiment for an uh, integrated circuit. And, um, well, we have here, well, this is the transistor dot on, on the, well, this is the piece of germanium here, and this is the transistor dot, and we have here the uh, three resistors and the capacities on that part here. So for the first time, we have, uh, we had five um, components of electric circuits on one or two pieces of uh, semiconducting material. And with this, very simple uh, circuit. Um, Jack Kilby in 1958 could show that uh, the frequency, in, this is a frequency inverter indeed. <clears throat> well, this is uh, my uh, next statement fast electronic computers are Cold War products. I um, believe that, especially the world of supercomputing. So with the, all these supercomputing research centers in the United States or in other places uh, in the 60s, 70s were driven by this Cold War competition. Who, uh, who is building the best missi uh, missiles, um, who has the best spaceships and, and, and whatever. Um, and then <clears throat> you see Slowly, we, uh, uh, we go further through the history of the computer. And um, in uh, the beginning of 1917, uh, um, something completely new happened. Well, this is the Altair machine. And for the first time, you could buy a computer for only 400 US dollar. So uh, at that time, this was completely new. Computers were extremely um, expensive and, uh, well, only <coughs> dedicated to uh, research labs or to universities or to huge companies. And the Altair um, was the first, we call it a home computer. You could board, you could uh, uh, buy it uh, for only $400, and it was a kit, so you 
uh, must assemble the machine on your own. And here we come to the original Apple I uh, board. We see it here on, on this. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely crazy story because nowadays this piece of electronics is indeed the most valuable uh, uh, piece in our museum. So probably you have uh, realized that in the past these Apple I machines, computers, or however you call them, the boards, um, were sold for more than $500,000. Unbelievable. So nowadays, this is our most valuable uh, exhibit, and we are currently thinking about um, presenting, in, presenting it in a more secure way. So <laughs> <laughs> our insurance uh, agent uh, got a little bit nervous so when we talked about this um, issue. But uh, once again, we should realize what, what, has, um, what has changed at that time. So Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, two clever guys, um, very familiar with electronics and all these computing things, um, they could go to the store. They could still go to the store and buy all these uh, components you see here on, on the board for $100. And the breakthrough was, of course, um, <coughs> it's not here, uh, it's here, so we here see this is the microprocessor. At that time, microprocessors were available, the heart of every computer nowadays, and they cost only $100. So you could go to the store and buy all this stuff, and just to assemble them and to sell uh, and to found the largest or the most valuable uh, company of uh, today. That's really a strange um, correlation. And I will put it in this way, uh, Radio Shack enabled Apple, <laughs> because this, uh, of course, uh, they went to the Radio Shock stores to buy all this computer stuff, um, put it together to sell, to sell the, the circuit boards for a lot of money, and so I believe that Steve Mosniak, uh, well, I'm in contact with him, so he has still at least 10 or 20 of these old Apple I boards, and he gives it to the collectors step by step to get yes, as. <laughs> but this was new. Go to a shop and buy a computer uh, or the computer equipment. So there are ten minutes left. That gives me the uh, opportunity to uh, tackle some special themes. So we have our permanent exhibition. Well, I, I stopped the, the uh, history of the computer at that point because I would like to present you some uh, projects we did in the past in terms of a special exhibition. And does anyone uh, has a clue what this is? This is the mind reading machine. <laughs> and designed by, or, or, or constructed by Claude Shannon uh, around 1950. Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, um, he was a gadgeteer, so he loved to build gadgets. And this uh, mind-reading machine was one of his gadgets, and we had it in our special exhibition about uh, the, uh, the Claude Shannon, and this machine was able to read your minds. Do you believe this? Yeah. <laughs> but it was a very easy task. It's uh, just the, um, well, how do you call the game when you throw a coin? It's yeah. tail or? It's yeah. tail or yeah. heads. Yeah. So it's just a question whether a machine can predict uh, random numbers. So when I try to produce random numbers, let's say, Zero zero one one zero one one zero zero. I'm completely bad in this uh, discipline because we don't have a sense for randomness. It's completely impossible to um, generate a good sequence of random numbers with our brains. And Shannon built a very tiny machines that could detect certain uh, strategies you are using while uh, assembling uh, while producing these random numbers. And uh, I was completely irritated. Whenever you play the uh, 
head <coughs> and tail game against the machine, you always lose. Always. Because uh, normally, well, you should win in 50% of the case, but the machine, um, uh, well, the, the algorithm in the machine really uh, catches you. And this, is, this was a very amazing artifact of the history of uh, intelligent systems, I would say. I made much more um, exhibits on display gadgets of Claude Shannon, his juggling machines, and uh, some other stuff. Um, I would put it in this way. Claude Shannon built the first machine to predict human behavior. <laughs> this is rather interesting because this is exactly what's going on right now. All the huge American IT companies, Amazon, uh, Apple, uh, Google, they try to uh, estimate or to, uh, yeah, to, say, to estimate the way you think. And so this is a huge business where you can earn a lot of money if you have a clear understanding of how your customers uh, think, then you can uh, earn a lot of money. And this is what all the algorithms do. So when we talk about these algorithms, we talk about estimating or describing the human um, way of thinking. And Shannon was indeed one of the first who built a real machine with a rather simple algorithm, but it worked. Another um, very popular thing is that we focus at the moment on what we call the retro computing. And this might interest um, well the practical um, people here. Uh, it's always a question, what can we show in our museum which is workable? So uh, this is a very tricky question. It's pretty hard to have the Commodore 64 running, uh, 64 running all the time. Um, but we decided to do a retro computing lab so that uh, whenever someone is interested or when we have museum events, we have a lot of machines which are um, hands-on exhibits so that can you really use. But they are not on daily uh, exposition, but only on special occasion. And I, I love this photos. Uh, I like this screenshot. Um, does anyone know what this is? Flight simulator. Well, this is uh, this was my first computer game, the flight simulator for the Sinclair ZX81. Um, and so it uh, needed the 60k memory extension, of course, and. <laughs> so loading time from an ordinary tape was around seven or eight minutes, and in the worst case, you received just a load error, and then just. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, I was so proud, um, and I, I could completely operate this uh, flight simulation. And to be honest, I'm not able to do this with the current product anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's. Uh, Another important task for a computer museum to um, keep this, uh, well, this way, the, the aesthetics and, and the, the computer graphic skills, and to present it to the young people. When I show it to kids, for instance, they don't believe that uh, 25 years ago we used such computer graphic to enjoy uh, uh, gaming. So it's. Retro computing is cool, I can recommend this to anyone here. There's a growing uh, interest in, in, this, in this field. So this is my personal feeling. Um, but we do, of course, more serious work as well. Uh, very recently, we got this wonderful um, microprocessor prototype. It's from 1973, and it's one of the first prototypes using the um, Intel 4004. Uh, chip set uh, in, in this machine and um, this again so people uh, can't believe that when I put this on the table and we are using we have uh, small uh, programs that we can run on the machine and when I tell someone well I'm just um, here starting the code and now the code runs and now the code finished so the people don't understand what I'm talking about and so that this is a, a way to, to operate a computer and I think it's interesting to have these exhibits um, as a hands-on um, option for, for the visitors. 
<coughs> and this was our treasure we found during the research uh, for the Alan Turing exhibition uh, in, in Paderborn. Well, this is uh, probably the smallest ever built uh, relay universal Turing machine. And uh, at, in the 1960s, um, a group at the University of Münster, they really built Turing machines. And this is a, a universal Turing machine with only four states, but it's complete. So it's a real uh, thing and it's still working. And you see here they uh, used these um, uh, film materials with 35 or half of a 35 film roll and the machine was able to punch this, um, this, this, this uh, holes here in, in, the, in, in the tape. So this is a translation um, to, for Lange tubing banner, long tuning tapes, and we operate the tuning machine in our museum on several um, problems, very theoretical problems, uh, but anyway we can use these uh, relay machines to do some sort of um, calculations. And whenever I uh, do a talk about these tuning machines, and we spend a lot of uh, research work on, 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 on the machines. And then I say, well, in principle, we can do a flight simulator simulation on, on this uh, um, electromechanical calculating device. So the people don't believe me, um, but it's true. So everything that can be done with a computer can be done with these uh, clickering uh, electromechanical device. It's a completely strange uh, thing, huh, isn't it? <coughs> Yeah, well, the name of the, uh, of the uh, well, head of this department was Gisbert Hasenjäger. And he, uh, this is my 14th um, uh, statement, built the first real universal Turing machine. So, and this is our upcoming project. Uh, I've spoken to some of you here in the audience in 1915. We will celebrate the 200th uh, anniversary of uh, Edda Lovelace and we will show a huge exhibition about life and the work of Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage and of course um, the subsequent women, the role of women in IT technology. And this is a very challenging uh, topic because we have to talk about gender issues and this is sometimes a little bit more complicated than uh, just displaying um, techno technology, let's say. But if anyone in the audience uh, has some good ideas of, for real artifacts um, according to the life and the work of other lovelace, I would really appreciate uh, a short hint or a Well, you are, of course, familiar the, um, with the um, Colossus uh, women uh, operating the Colossus machine in Bletchley Park. This will be one part of the story um, in World War II. We will deal with the Indiac girls and um, maybe, which is rather unknown, is that even the women or the wives of the physicists in Los Alamos, so Miss Fermi or Miss Bloch, they did a lot of computational work in Los Alamos as well. So they uh, calculated the whole day. And this is rather unknown, the, uh, well, the impact of women in Los Angeles the Manhattan Project uh, in terms of supporting computer technology, calculating technology. You know this, uh, Ella Lovelace wrote the first computer program, a small piece of software to calculate the binomial um, coefficients. And this will be one, this, this will be the starting point of our exhibition that opens in 2015. <coughs> well, this is, uh, I will close the, uh, the talk with a uh, final overview. These are the two main floors of our 4,500 square meter exhibition place for the permanent exhibition. This is the um, Birth, the, the top perspective. 
and of course you can go to our web page um, but you should definitely come to Paderborn uh, to, to, to discover the way we present the history of the computer I have put together all my 15 statements again to open the discussion at that point um, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and um, as I said it was a pleasure to tell you something about our philosophy of how we present the history of the computer um, middle in, in the middle of nowhere um, <laughs> thanks a lot unit uh, where we uh, present internet technology or the history of the internet that this is the missing link yeah. so because we uh, realized that so the machines uh, has uh, have merged into only one piece of hardware let's say the smartphone smartphone can do anything it calculates it communicates it, it's uh, suited, uh, well suited for game, gaming and so there's only one device and it doesn't matter um, if it is a Google device or an Apple or whatever, uh, the question is what is the software aspect for these systems? And um, this is the great challenge from my point of view. We have to talk about software uh, in the future because, well, if we look at a desktop PC, well, it's a boring piece of, of hardware, but the important um, process actually happens in, in, the, in the world of software. And, this is what we are currently working on. <coughs> and, uh, well, according to Klotz, I went to Greenwich yesterday and I've seen all these wonderful uh, Harrison clocks uh, in the observatorium. And it's definitely a very fascinating and interesting topic. Terry. Um, I appreciate the lot of the points you put up there are what we say in English, tongue in cheek. <laughs> Um, but the one I would challenge is, is about the invention uh, of the binary system, if indeed it was invented and wasn't discovered. Um, according to Knuth's art of computer programming, the binary system was invented by English wine merchants because one um, gill, two gills are one pint, two pints are one quart, two quarts are something I don't know the name of, two, two of those things are one gallon, two gallons are a firkin, two firkins are a bottle of water, <laughs> something like that, I forget the details. <laughs> um, how is your organisation financing it? Who pays for it? So it's the Heinz Nixdorf Foundation, the Foundation Westfalen, and this is indeed at least the money um, from the uh, from the company when it goes to or when it went to Siemens. So it's, it's a investment. private foundation that uh, operates by this fine uh, supports our museum. But you. Mm. <laughs> you have to talk about exchange rains, that's not that. <laughs> uh, I don't think you mentioned anything about um, computer language, programming languages in your talk. Um, I mean, in England, we, you know, we started off with things like Autocodes and Fortran. Did you have that sort of thing in Germany, or did you have your own languages and then perhaps go on to Fortran? How, how did it work? I think we have all the same uh, programming languages. I wrote on the connection machine, for instance, all Fortran 77 code with the uh, seven uh, spaces in the, in the beginning. Um, 
people I came from my days. But what it's, uh, what's interesting is that uh, Konrad Zuse developed mm -hmm. the, uh, one of the first programming languages, the plant calcul. And this was a really sophisticated system to describe uh, the mathematical programs, uh, or problems. And he wrote in his plant calcul uh, a chess algorithm, just to play chess. But uh, it was not so uh, sophisticated because he had only one value for all uh, figures. So, uh, copy pieces. pieces. So it was not really a clever <coughs> chess algorithm. But he wrote it down in his um, programming language. And I completely agree. Uh, programming language are a very uh, important uh, aspect in the history of the computer. So I have a question, but a point of information just to the last one. Um, the um, chap Nicholas Witt, who did um, Modular and Pascal lang uh, languages, is German Swiss. I think we should pay him the authority on German programming languages. And they were certainly very influential. <laughs> Nicholas Witt, yeah. with um, Pascal and Modular, Modular 2, are very influential languages. Yeah. So I think we can play with some German influence in programming languages. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to quibble with your first bullet um, that Richard Feynman was the first computer creator. Um, certainly the University of Cambridge, um, immediately pre-war, I think in 1937, started its mathematical laboratory, which was an institution for collecting calculating gadgets with much the same purpose. Uh -huh. And I'm sure other universities must have been doing the same thing at the same time. I think it was quite common to have a a computing facility and lots of machines, and people who worked in it had to be quite good mechanics instrument makers, as well as able to do the mathematics. Okay, then I will skip this first statement. <laughs> 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 that was just an introduction to work, because I think it's uh, interesting to look at the uh, secret Los Alamos world when we talk about the beginning of the computers, because it's sometime in the uh, literature under has no, not under represented. Agreed. <clears throat> oh sorry. Sitting no, no, there no, quietly just the back. Just sitting here looking after the camera. Um, I suppose a couple of controversial points. Um, Shockley, the man who gets the credit for inventing the transistor, and there are lots of things to be said on that, um, was actually born an Edwardian gentleman in London by about five days before Edward died. <laughs> um, but uh, there, there are lots of, uh, of interesting things about him. I think one of the great points about uh, the development of the transistor and uh, particularly the ones that worked as opposed to his original point contact one um, was that Shockley was actually very good at picking the right people. He might not have been very good at much else but he did actually pick a team for his own company that went, then went bust. They went on to work for Fairchild and then went on to found Intel. So one of the great talents and one of the great things in, in the history of computing is actually spotting the right people at the right moment. to hear that uh, you have uh, devices that are uh, working and then you have devices that are hands-on. What's your relationship with the Berlin Museum, which I understand takes a different view? Um, sorry, the last part, could you go <laughs> Berlin, what? Berlin Museum, I understand, yeah. doesn't want to have the kit working and on display. Yeah, and that's... Uh, What's your relationship with them? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the relationship with the uh, Deutsches Museum in Berlin is uh, really good, so in general. Um, it's true they don't want that the people use the uh, exhibits, so especially kids. And um, what we try to test is a um, uh, compromise, let's say. Mm -hmm. So uh, the kids are not allowed, the kids are allowed to use our hands on. Uh, that we rebuild from the original pieces. That, that's fine, or they can use media stuff, that's another problem. 
But when we talk about using the original um, objects, then I would turn to this retro uh, lab approach so that we have uh, certain events, the night of the museums or uh, the family day, so there are many events during the year, and then we present this old stuff, and then everyone can use it, but with the uh, assistance. So this is our approach we would like to, to try, because we know that we can't, um, in general, make all objects in the exhibition as hands-on exhibition uh, objects. This, from my perspective, this is not uh, possible. Um, so we would like to do a compromise. So and every, if everyone is complaining about the fact that he cannot use the C uh, the Commodore 64 in, as an original device, then we would uh, argue, okay, come next week to the museum night, then all the machines are on the desk and you can use them, you can play summer games, winter games, whatever you want, uh, you can try them, and this would be our uh, proposal there. I should explain, at a conference earlier in the year, we were talking about how best to display computer hardware and working systems in museums. A very nice lady from Berlin was very quiet for the whole <laughs> two days until eventually she completely exploded. And, uh, <laughs> nothing should ever be switched on again. <laughs> so. One thing which comes across uh, very much from your talk is the universality of computing. The, there are, if, 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 if it's things are more at the same time everywhere, but there are also parallel things. <coughs> You talked about final organization of the mathematicians and so on. Napoleon had done that earlier to try to get um, mathematical tables organized. Babbage used that idea in his uh, analytical machine. So these ideas bubble up again and again and across a wide part of the, uh, the known world. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, what you, that Chinese and let it move a long time before the others. They didn't exploit it perhaps like Gutenberg did, or that, that was quite clear. But it's this, the way the human uh, spirit is, all over the world is able to come up with ideas, and comes up with very similar ideas. Mm. I'm, I, I, I have a concern which is prompted um, or I'm reminded of it by your uh, point number nine um, about the not so much uh, I won't go into the, the issue around the, the, the Nazi invention of computers um, but uh, both in the UK and certainly in Germany there was huge use um, of punch card equipment and I do wonder sometimes whether um, museums and history books are failing to put sufficient emphasis on the use of punch cards, particularly in the commercial environment. Uh, I mean, the Prudential Insurance Company in, in, in the UK bought uh, the, a, a manufacturer of punch card equipment because it was so critical to their business. Um, and somehow or other, um, the story of the computer tends to get focused on the scientific applications and its origins in the story that's told in the UK very often on uh, code breaking. The uh, part of the history which is its commercial use, the evolution of old fashioned pre war punch card equipment the addition of computers in order to do better calculations uh, and uh, ultimately have much greater power as we would think of it now to do calculations. That part of the story I think sometimes gets forgotten. The millions of punch cards that were being produced every year in the 1930s uh, commercially. Um, that was a huge information processing activity and it's a strand which I think can be undervalued and under presented uh, in a museum context in comparison to the scientific uses of computing. 
Well, I should mention at that point, um, it was the aim of Heinz Nixdorf himself to focus on what we call the mid-sized computer systems. Um, so somewhere in between, this was the market that Nixdorf thought that this would be the best market for his uh, company. So focus not on the uh, scientific world with the universities and the research labs, uh, but not on the home computers and, and <coughs> personal things, but just go in the middle so that there is a, a small company, a bank, and doing uh, accounting uh, issues. And uh, he had to focus on exactly this uh, target group, I would say. So, and you will see in, in the museum a lot of punch card equipment uh, it's, and, and the mid-size computerware. So following on from that question, there seems to be a, a lack in these museums of um, the history and development of peripheral devices, yes. because most of them are more commercial than, than scientific. So mm -hmm. um, things like uh, discs, um, printers, uh, input output devices, all of these, without those, you wouldn't have had a commercial use of computers. A small joke point on your point number three. If you ask on the internet, uh, how long is the data on my CD or DVD going to last? Uh, the most reliable answer seems to be if you want your data to last, then you better write it on papyrus <laughs> <laughs> and then store it in the desert. And obviously, from what you've said, clay tablets. Everything else is just guesswork. We don't have a clue how long. Well, there are two aspects um, important. The first is um, what about the material? So does it, the information remain in the material for a long, long time? But the other important question is that the decoding process remain uh, uh, known. Um, so this is another problem. So now, so when we we look at some old software documents, we are not able to. To, to, to load them because there is no converting tool available. So you need the material and you need the algorithm. Um, so there's two uh, kinds of the same story. Um, but there's a wonderful art project a couple of years ago. Um, you could send your uh, homepage to a sculpture somewhere, I guess, in, in, in South Europe and he uh, produced a real stone uh, out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was delivered to the trolley. Uh, so <laughs> you could take your uh, home page with you. <laughs> Dan, wait. you all sit at the back. Yeah, sorry, I will. I'll make you walk. It's a good idea. Um, the idea that the, the uh, German wartime administration, shall we say, ignored the computer. Um, I remember Horst Zuzer saying at the conference that you should never really take decisions after the third beer. And I remember a conversation with Horst uh, after the third, or well, indeed possibly even fourth beer, um, about his, his father's uh, development of machines during the war period. And uh, he seemed to feel uh, that it actually fell into the, oh well the war will be over by Christmas, we don't need to spend the money on it. Um, concept and of course as each Christmas came and went there was less perhaps less and less easy to get hold of the more sophisticated components that uh, Conrad Zuzer was looking for to develop his machines um, so uh, you know it's an old story it'll be over by Christmas yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, from my point of view it's an interesting point to talk about uh, how a government uh, trust the civilian people. Mm. So this is a very important question. And I think there are uh, different um, approaches uh, in, in the German cultural uh, context with the Nazis and the Second World War. So they didn't trust the, uh, let's say in a very general manner, they didn't trust the uh, civilian peoples. And this was completely, so the, um, all the secrets uh, of Bletchley Park 
was uh, distributed to many well, hundreds, thousands of civilian people working on that project. And I think this was a, this was a different approach. This what was possible in, in the United States just to collect all these uh, crazy civilian professors, physics professors, uh, bring them to one place and let's work uh, on the most secret uh, project at that time. And well, I'm not sure if this would have happened in, in, in Germany at that time. But this is, well, I'm not a historian, uh, mm -hmm. so this should, uh, well, the discussion should do someone else. Well, thank you very much indeed for being up to your Drop me whenever some one of you uh, shows up in Paderborn. Just drop me a note, please. So. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to remind you all about the December meeting, which is on the second Thursday in December, the twelfth at two thirty p.m. here, and that's when Dr. Tony Freeth will be talking about the anti-kithera <laughs> device found in the shipwreck of a Roman ship, which was filled with plunder from the Greek world. And the shipwreck was discovered in 1901, although the significance of the device wasn't realised at that time. Um, so it promises to be an absolutely fascinating meeting from someone who was directly involved in unravelling the mystery. So I hope to see you all then. And please, if you can sign that you were here on your way out, that would be really good. And... Um, if anybody ha has a problem with the quality of their uh, Resurrection magazine, um, we have some copies here for you to replace it with. So thank you very much. <laughs>